communication works with symbols, so it works with, with different, different ways. And so does the economy. I asked you to read the text. We finally come there. We already have been talking about Bologna a little bit. The, or some of the core issues of the text by Engels are these, first and foremost, these two issues of production of the means to support human life. Beginning from the basics, meaning we need something to eat and to drink, we need some shelter, and of course it can mean very different things. Depending on your wealth, if you are wealthy you can have a a schloss or a beautiful castle. If you are not so rich, you are living somewhere, and in the extreme case, you, you just grab something that covers you against rain. Food, the same thing. I'm always amazed here in China, or kind of still, uh, <coughs> that in the European perspective, or from the European perspective, uh, rice is the, the food in China. So I expected myself, seeing myself only eating rice, uh, not only, but, but at least having kind of permanently rice there. And I uh, went to, to dinners, to meals, where, where there was no rice at all. Because rice is a staple good, economics, is a staple good which is there just to fill your stomach. And if you want to eat something really nice, you don't eat rice. You eat something else. And then, of course, it depends again on you have different options. And you may even eat something European. Some, some people like this. The Europeans always go to Chinese restaurants and the Chinese go to, to European restaurants. Anyway, so this is the production of the means to support human life. Whatever we need, whatever we need in the widest sense. Next to production, the exchange of things produced. We are talking now about a, a specific society, historically specific, meaning not about any society, but here we are talking about production and exchange of things that we produced. We are aiming on producing already for the market, for exchange. Because of that, we try to be especially productive, efficient, because we don't produce just what we need. We don't produce just what we need and exchange immediately with somebody else. So to be highly productive, we come to the division of labor. And the division of labor is something fascinating. It's another core issue of economics. And to some extent, it's, it's very visible. You cannot produce a building, a huge building, like here around the corner, on your own. There is division of labor. There are experts who are actually doing the building work, and you have somebody for the plumbing, and then you have all these experts. This is division of labor. And there it's very obvious that not everybody can do everything. But even if you read this now or later, preferably later, you see even the production of a pin, of this tiny thing, too small to be found in the haystack, is produced more effectively when it follows the rule of division of labor. It can be done by an individual. Simply, I produce it on my own. If I go through this process of division of labor, if there is somebody expert in a very small part of the overall process of production, 
then it's getting more effective, more efficient use of material. You don't have this loss, you don't have this loss of time. And we saw kitchen stories. This clip, I don't know who, who, who watched it on, on the, uh, the, the, the whole video. But there you see the idea is we waste time. We waste energy. I do this actually walking up and down. We waste energy instead of standing put, staying there, and using the most efficient way what we really have to do. This is increasing our productivity if we only do what we have to do. Cutting the wire. Things like this. And then we end up, each person therefore making a tenth part of 48,000 pins might be considered as making 4,800 pins in a day. After producing just on his her own, I think it was one pin. So it's now this huge amount, 4,800 pins in a day, compared with one. This is progress. Imagine this. Imagine what it means for you if you could sit there, and now it's getting difficult in our area, you don't have to read all the books, but you read one, everybody reads one book, and we have read together all these books. Now, I said it's difficult, it's difficult to imagine, but this is what happens in academic work. You have your economists, you have your sociologists, you have your medical uh, uh, staff, you're, you're, you have your different subjects. This is division of labor. All these old grandfathers uh, <coughs> of science, of academia, they had been reading pretty much everything. They had been looking different uh, subjects, different disciplines. What is going there? How can we combine it? Is it useful for us? Sometimes, occasionally, we do it today as well, but usually it's just this uh, orientation on one thing. Making it possible to produce much more than we would produce just on our own. Support of human life exchange, division of labor to, pr to increase productivity. And now this, this new system he is talking about is the kingdom of free competition, of personal liberty, of the quality before the law of all commodity owners. This was a fundamental break with the previous feudal system. With the previous feudal system, we produced for the one lord. Be it the leader of the tribe, be it the king, be it the emperor, or whatever. He, usually it was he, was deciding what was produced, how it was produced, and how much it was. It was not up to you, because actually you didn't have any interest to produce more. If you would produce more, I will take it. So why should you produce more if you only produce for me? There's not any real reason for this. We are coming back to law then. in the general sense, although it is the preparation of the law you will do later and we will briefly touch upon. There is in the course outline industrial revolution and no revolution, no development comes from nothing, comes from, starts from the scratch. Industrial revolution was very much linked, a consequence if you want, follow up of the French or of the bourgeois revolution. It was especially in France at the time. And it was exactly about these three values. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. 
that is liberty. Sometimes language is actually simple. Equality and fraternity. Those years, there had been different terms spinning around. These had been the central terms. They had been then taken later in the Constitution as well. But there had been others, unité, on the visibility de la République, liberté, égalité, fraternité. This was about building a state. The modern state was coming up here. Indivisible, indivisibility and unity of the republic. This was a new state coming up. There was as well this new idea of sûreté, which is security, and propriété, which is of course prop property. Private property. It was not the property of the king or of the leader or whatsoever. It was, and in this way you have to read it together with liberty, it was the private property of everybody. John Locke is one of the proponents here. He said private property is one of the fundamental rights everybody has. And it is in this way that security, where is it? Surety. Surety is important. It's protecting your right to property. Then we have these two terms, or the one here, fraternity, fraternity, mutual support, it's difficult to, to define. And mind the sequence. It's liberty, it's liberty, the freedom, and then egal, uh, equality, and then fraternity. Means you are free, you have to look after yourself. There is no king, no tribune, and no god. You know this one song uh, where it actually says this. And then you have equality as the second part because first you have to be free and then you can be equal because everybody has the same right. And then you have the support of others as something which is difficult to define. How far do we get? Because there is even a kind of contradiction that liberty means you should not depend on support by others. If I support you, you are depending on my support. This limits your freedom. This is the argument. And this is where it comes to this complex issues of the understanding of a general political kind of justice. It's not just that the king, the emperor or whosoever has more and can control everything, just is if everybody can control his, her own life and life in society. It's not just that I say to you, use blackboard. In the strict sense, you should be able to decide on your own what you want to do. OK, there are certain conditions that limit liberty, that limit or define justice. And this is where we have certain rights. We define rights and obligations. It's a political process. We kind of balance different options and try to say at the end of the day, OK, this is the most just way of doing it. 
criteria are different in any case, in every case. And then we have this problem, in a way, of narrowing it down and make law out of it. It's a highly exciting process to make laws. If you are into the details, it's pretty boring because you have to turn every word 20 times around. Um, I did this once with the Constitution. It was kind of fun. But then you, have, you go back, in a way, to say these legal norms, these laws, have to comply, comply with some general, not idea of justice, but with, again, something we are struggling with, natural rights or human rights. It's a kind of natural right, a human right, to be alive. If I'm not alive, I'm not a human being. So, to be a human being, I have to have the right to be alive. Is this really a general right given to everybody under all circumstances? I had to prove this once. Um, when they asked me, actually, would you kill somebody if this person threatened somebody next to you? This is what, you, what, what happened at that time when you didn't want to go to military service in Germany. So they tried to, to say, what do you do, actually? You say you don't, you, you can't kill anybody. Now, a typical question, you're going with your girlfriend and somebody comes, jumps in front of you and threatens you and wants to threaten your, your girlfriend. What do you do? You have, just by accident, you have a knife or you have a gun. Just by accident. Would you kill this person to protect your girlfriend? Now, the problem is, dilemmas, we talked about it. At the end of the day, you are in danger to kill somebody. Because if you don't kill this person, this person may kill your girlfriend. So, what is the story? How do you deal with it, with this human right to, to live? And is it a natural right given by nature? In some cases, it's very easy to say. But then as well, is it a natural right, for instance, or a human right, when it comes to education, every, education for everybody? And how can you then make it compatible with the law? If I say everybody has the right to obtain of education, I am troubled. Because then I have to make sure that you have the means to obtain of the education. Or I say, yeah, of course you have the right. Just try to get it. That's not my responsibility. So these are the typical struggles, if you want, that we face then while we are talking about rights. And these are all, in one way or another, linked to economics. Because at the end of the day, at the core of these debates, you see this right to produce the means to support human life, meaning what do you need? Can you actually produce it? And what is necessary, what is needed to produce it? And it is about exchange. Can you really freely exchange? Are you equal on the market? Or is there something that makes life difficult? We are talking about here about human rights, and that's fine. We all go with it. And then we have this funny thing to define actually who is human being. Now, from today's perspective, it seems to be quite obvious 
that women are human beings. And they claimed, we are talking about human rights, natural rights, French Revolution. And then they have had this thing, hugely questionable, Declaration des droits de l'homme et du citoyen. The rights, the declaration of the rights of men haha, and the citizen. So only men, and in French you have this difference, only men and only citizens are human beings. If you are a woman, you don't fall under this protection. If you are not citizen of France, you are not falling under this constitution. Now, it seems to be kind of absurd for us. But if you look what happened to colonies, these people, if you, ha if you look at what happened to slaves, these people had not been considered to be human beings. These have been extremes. If you go back and look at the educational system, I don't know how many years you have to go back, but it's not so long that I would sit in a very small class here only with the male students. Because women had not been allowed to go to university, they had not been considered to be part with the full words. I remember in the 1970s in, the, in Germany, women had been property, legally property of the men. It was legally a kind of, I wouldn't say questionable, it was very clear, but the, the property right was not the full, full right over the women, children as well, but there was this control by the men, the men could decide legally, this was the property de definition part of it, you don't work. I don't, I don't want you to work as woman. I'm married to you and you don't work. That's my decision and I can decide and you cannot work against it. This was not about pressure of, no, listen, love, I would like you to stay here and have a nice life and I can care for you. This was a legally defined right or lack of right. Then 1789 and 1791, Madame Olympe de Gauche came up and said, let's, no, come on, revolution. You want to change the system. Where are we? It's about 50% of the population. And you just ignore us. So, we need a Déclaration du droit de la femme et de la citoyenne. A small difference between citoyen and citoyenne. The right for the woman and the right for the female citizen. Sorry for the non-citizens still out. So this was a step... Actually, the Déclaration des droits de la femme had not been included into the Declaration of the National Assembly, but it was at least this political pressure. We, we have to move on. We can't stay there. There is something else, and I emphasized it, um, and in this way it's possibly even more visible uh, using the French. L'homme et la femme. La femme is singular. With men, at least with the pronunciation, as well with the women, in English it's not so clear. Sometimes you get easily mixed up. Is it one woman or is it women? That's very close. But femme and l'homme are completely different. And it is singular. La is singular. It's not les femmes. So it is about individuals. Going back to this, liberté, égalité, fraternité, it is about the individual rights. It's not women 
and men in plural having the rights, but it is about the woman and the man who has the right. The individual citizen and the, well, the, in, the individual male citizen and the individual female citizen. This was what they had been talking about, and this was what they have had in mind. And this was, of course, something that you can link then immediately, this individual principle of individuality, you can li link immediately to this idea, what I said before, of production. You are responsible for yourself. No king, no tribune, no god is looking after you. It's up to you. And in the extreme case, it's not up to the fraternity, the charity, the church, or whatever, looking after you, your community, but it is you as individual. You produce, and you produce for the market. Hugely central in this entire debate. Because we can move from there as well to another level of law, Namely, whenever you go to the shop and do something, have a small trade there, you are engaging in a contract. Even if you don't sign this document, there is always implicitly a contract involved. And contracts are, by definition, agreements between individuals. Even if you hear this term, Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, or some, somebody else, he, he was coining this uh, term, actually, the social contract. There is no social contract. It's always, in this law, a contract between individuals. Even if the individuals are groups, an enterprise, a university, you go to a university, you don't sign a contract with me, or with the president, or with the dean. You sign a contract with the university. Legally, the university is a person, is one person. Even if there are many people. And there is division of labor again, there's a certain division of labor that somebody, one person, is responsible for this and that. You sign legally the contract with the president, but the president can, I, I don't know actually if he can teach economics, possibly he can, but if he can, he probably cannot teach biology. And he cannot do the administration at the same time. And he cannot, so there is this division. He signs, he is responsible for everything in legal terms, but he doesn't do everything. Agreement based on free will. It's up to you to say, I want to sign this contract. You can read it up front. You know what you get. You know what you have to pay. You know your rights and obligations. Free will, and then you can say, yeah, I sign it. Or you can say, no, that's not what I'm looking for. Being taught in English? Taught like torture? No. I want another one. Formally equal. Go back to this equality. Formally equal, there is nobody who has a priori a special right, more rights than the other. Two parties. Equal rights, mutual obligations, and mutual benefits. I cannot say, say, or we cannot agree on something where you actually don't have any obligations and where you don't have any benefit. Even if the benefit may be, or the, the obligation is, except that you don't have benefits. There are legally sometimes tricky things that you would say there is, it's, it's not this mutuality, but actually it is that somebody says, 
Yes, I oblige myself not to have rights. So legally, this is why you have a law profession and why you have to learn, learn this. But uh, basically, it is mutual obligations, mutual benefits. It's not, I get all the benefits out of it, and you have to pay. Be it in money, be it with time, be it in whichever. Then it is limited to the expressed obligations, meaning that's it. We sign something, we define in this contract what it is about, and that's what you get. I don't know exactly what you get. You get 15 weeks each week, or over these 15 weeks, you have so many lectures and seminars, and you cannot say, you cannot claim, I want to have 16 weeks and to have one week more lectures. I cannot claim to say to you, but I want to see you more often. In the contract, it defines strictly what it is about, and that's it. Now, of course, we can negotiate, but this is outside of the contract, basically. So these four conditions defining a contract, agreement based on free will between two free formally equal partners, even if one of the partners can be, or both of the partners can be, not just individuals as such. Mutual obligations, mutual benefits, and limited to what the contract actually says. With all this, in connection with all this, we find this major shift. If you remember the one slide, I said we start with this management, with this household, autarchy. We have a very limited area. We produce what we need. This kind of immediate mutual exchange. We don't need more. We just produce this. We produce what we need, meaning it is linked to the use value. Now we have this sea change kind of following up from this French Revolution, from the system change. 19th century civilization, was a kind of longish process, Alone was economic in a different and distinctive sense, for it chose to base itself on a motive only rarely acknowledged as valid in the history of human societies, and certainly never before raised to the level of a justification of action and behavior in everyday life, namely gain. This was this idea now I'm not interested in how you feel. I'm not interested in to support you. I'm not interested actually in the use value of anything. What I'm really interested in is gain. I want to gain, I want to earn something by my economic activity. If you go back to this definition from Engels, or these three points of, four points of Engels, you have this shift of, first it is the production of what I need for subsistence. This is the core of production. Now I produce for exchange. I'm actually not interested in, anymore predominantly in the use value of something. Can you, you really use it? I'm interested in producing something for sale, to be on the market. And of course, I don't do it because Adam Smith, because I want to be good and provide you with whatever I produce. But I do so because I want to gain something. Adam Smith has this sentence, I should know it by heart. Uh, it's, it's something, it's, it's not the, the baker, the butcher, don't produce to make you feeling happy, make you feeling satisfied because you get your bread, you get your meat or whatever, but he do, does it 
for his own interest because he wants to get money out of it. He wants to sell the product and not to see you eating the bread. With this, the self-regulating market system was uniquely derived from this principle. So you have a completely different way of social relationships now. It's based on contract. It's based not on what do you need, but it is based on this idea of signing up for a contract which defines what you get, but as well what I want to have, and this is gain. Now you find similar things much earlier in history. I think Sophocles was something complaining, giving out in ancient Greek, money, 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 everybody is looking for money and they are not interested in the others. But here it's a new system, it's a systematic thing, not of individuals looking for their own advantage, but this is the economic system now defining what you have to do and defining it in this way of especially four conditions that shape uh, society. Bob Jessup taking up on Polanyi and saying the first thing is this commodity form. And this commodity form is now not only there as the goods we produce for being used, but it is now as well about land, labor, land, and money. We will see later soon what it is about, but labor and land are not produced really. Now they are still regulated by the market. Let's leave it for the while for, for time there. And now it is kind of this everything is going into this thinking of profit and loss. The mental setting behind it is if I don't gain anything, if I don't get anything out of it, I won't do it. As simple as that. And I will calculate exactly do I get enough out of it? Is it worthwhile to do it or not? Profit and loss. I invest. Every thinking is coined by this idea of I invest. I invest in order to get more out of it at the end of the day. And then we come to the superior dynamism and reach of a globalizing capitalist economy, which causes more trouble than, it actually, than, than we actually gain. The typical example here is environmental damage. We produce on a large scale. We don't consider the negative side effects. We only produce for our personal or national gain. And this is, of course, something you find in smaller units, you find in communities, you find even in the families. This principle of competition. I do what is good for me. And this is going through kind of the entire life. This is the decisive thing. You only think wherever you go in terms of profit and loss. And you find all this in terms of uh, clothes, dresses, design. You find it as well in terms of, even if we, we of course, we don't admit this, but it's, it's kind of somewhere playing a role. We use our friendships in some way or another. Is this good for me? And be honest, we. We, we don't do this explicitly, but there is this dimension to it. 
that at least at some stage we may consider if we have the choice or if we have to, cho to choose we may consider actually I think I go today with this group because they may have already the exam questions or whatsoever instead of going with the other group I, I would prefer them but still there is this thing of I, I need my certificate so this is the it's, it's an in uh, an, an implicit guideline. We don't strictly behave in this way, but there is always this push. Think about it before you do it. Think about it if it's really the right thing, if you get enough out of it. And this is the running of society as an adjunct to the market. It means society still exists. We have our social contacts and we have all this. But the dominant idea behind it is that it is guided by society, social contacts are guided by the markets, are guided by products. You buy products, you buy commodities, not necessarily because they are useful. You buy something not because you like it, but you buy it because there is a certain status involved. It's a very complex thing. There is no single answer, but at least this is the idea behind it. You have to have this and that status, and this is something you buy on the market. And of course, everybody says, yeah, I know everybody does it, but I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm really honest to myself and I only buy what I need and I only buy what I really like and, and, and. This is not the question. The question is this, this general push. And sometimes it's even an objective push that we need something to perform in the requested way. You have to, if you go apply for a job, you have to have a suit or you have to have a proper, proper dress and you cannot turn up in, in which way ever with your casual clothes. There is a certain outfit that is required, requested for certain contexts. So this is the shift Economy controls society, and it's not that society controls the economy. This means as well that the controlling instances are moving to those of the, of the market, of the productive system, and that they gain actually influence as well over politics. I'm not talking about strict, or not necessarily talking about the strict control, but I'm talking about what is the interest behind it. Are they led by the economic, economic interests, or are they starting from the other point and saying, we have to look after the people, and then we can look after the economic system? These are two different ways. And then, of course, if it comes to concrete political processes, it depends on whom do you invite as expert. Is it somebody who tells you a day in a life, or is it somebody who tells you about the perspective of the enterprise? So this is where we will continue then for the next lesson.